Ahoy there, Captain Benzie here, coming at you with another episode of the Destroyer Pilots Manifesto, the series that aims to teach you everything you'll need to know about the various different destroyers in EVE Echoes. Today we're going to be taking a back-to-basics look at the Tech 3 Galente destroyer, the Catalyst. Now, this ship has bonuses that seem to be geared towards snub-nosed railguns, and when fit with snub-nosed railguns, actually has the highest possible DPS output of any of the mainline turret gunship destroyers, so it is going to out-DPS the Thrasher, the Coercer, and the Cormorant if it's fit with snub-nosed and flown properly. So we're going to have a look at how you could fit this and fly this as a new pilot, starting out in Evecos for the first time, and then we're going to look at upgrading into the Catalyst Navy issue, and how that, that can also be used as an Alpha pilot to get some seriously good level content done with a good ISK per hour running ratio. We're going to have a look at that later on and talk about that in full detail. I know a lot of people seem to hate destroyers, but these things are cheap to skill into and are very useful for early mission running. Yes, they do have their problems, notably that they're a little bit larger than you might like them to be, and they don't have the tank to support that, so they're fairly easy to hit and they're fairly fragile. But they're also faster than cruisers in certain cases, certainly early on here, and are a lot cheaper, so make excellent mission runners early on for an alpha player. Anyway, if you do enjoy this video, let me know by hitting like on it, sub to the channel for all things Eve Echoes, ding the notification bell to never miss an upload, and let me know in the comment section down below what ships and topics you want to see me cover in future videos. If you do want to go the extra mile to help support this channel, we do have a Redbubble merchandise store where you can pick up all kinds of cool loot, and there is a Patreon page if you wish to come and pledge to donate to help support this channel. Every pledge, every dollar really helps. All that said and done then, let's jump right in to talking about the Galente line of destroyers, the Catalyst. The Catalyst line of destroyers are the Galente Federation's main line turret destroyers, often referred to as their gunboat destroyers. This means they are the equivalent of the Minmatar Thrasher, the Amar Coercer, and the Kaldari Cormorant. Now, if you've been following the Destroyer Pilots Manifesto since the beginning, you'll know that destroyers fall into one of two categories. Either they are these mainline turret destroyers, or they're the secondary line that uses the secondary weapon of that particular nation. For the Galente, of course, their secondary weapon is drones, so it's the Algos forms their secondary line of destroyers. We don't care about the secondary line of destroyers for the purposes of this video. We're here to talk about the Catalyst line, which starts here at tech level 3 and is one of their gunboat destroyers. It's using turrets, it's using railguns. So, if we have a look at the Catalyst, this is a very unusual looking destroyer. It's very asymmetrical, which in fairness, asymmetrical and unusual is kind of the calling card of Galente ship design. The capsule location does appear to be here behind these lights, and then you've got this long protrusion out to the port side of the ship here, um, almost like a wing with a couple of small propulsion units on the back of it. On the starboard side, however, you have this massive propulsion unit there, which is also apparently under the radar and sensor array, and which is holding this all together. Now, of course, some people have said, how on earth do you fly a ship like this? Remember, in space, you don't really need symmetrical design like an, in a, like an actual uh, suborbital aircraft would. So it does make sense that it's completely asymmetrical like this. It's just a very unusual design, and I'm <laughs> I'm never quite sure if I like it. It's charming, but I'm like, it just feels weird to fly. It does get some cool skins, though. We have, first of all, the Earth skin. Most of the mainline turret destroyers do get these, and this has sort of a very Aztec feel to it, I find. Sort of that gold and that rusty brown color, along with that sort of Incan skull design there in the center. We have the Exoplanets Hunter. Exoplanets are all to do with uh, like exploration, and this is a very cool skin that's in that bright orange colour, and it does use dark blue on some of the others that you'll see as well if you spot the Exoplanet Hunters elsewhere. We had a cool Halloween skin that is probably as vibrant as you can get a Catalyst, with that vibrant orange and luminous metallic yellow around it. I'm never quite sure about this skin. Purity of the Throne, if you're a closet Amar supporter but don't want to fly Amar ships. And of course, the awesome Titanium Silver skins. Now, I've talked about these at length in the past. I love these skins. That sort of mix of gunmetal grey and sort of bright, vibrant silver with that orange detailing. Just looks badass as all hell. Anyway, let's talk about the attributes and fittings. So, the Catalyst being a Tech 3 destroyer has three high slots, which of course are where you're going to be putting your turrets. These are designed around railguns, so you're going to be putting three different railguns here in the top. You've got two mid slots, which are going to be things like tackle, um, e-war, that kind of thing that you can put in there. 
And the low slots, you've got three of them, which gives you a decent amount of variety between things like tanking modules, weapon upgrade modules, and propulsion units as well, which we can pop into there. Now for a Tech 3 ship, the defense isn't bad. 2,929, we're almost at 3,000 defense here, most of which is on the structure, which is not is kind of the Galente calling card. They tend to have the highest structure of all of the, t the ships of the particular types. So if you look across the different tier 3 destroyers here, you'll see that the, uh, the Catalyst has the highest structure. The armor's not quite as high as the Coercer, the shield is definitely nowhere near as high as the, um, the, the, uh, the Cormorant, sorry, I couldn't think of what the Glente, uh, the Caldari one was called. Shield obviously isn't as high as the Cormorant, but it does have a very high structure and a decent spread between armor and shield, whereas the Coercer, the Amar ship, is heavily into armor, but has pitiful shields. The Catalyst kind of gets a nice mix of both. As we look at the rest of its stats here, you can see we have a power grid output of 54 megawatts, which is sizable enough that we can comfortably fit pretty much anything that we want to on here. And the capacitor bank at 480 gigajoules is pretty sizable for a ship this size, and it's not going to cause us any problems, which is a really nice thing to have if you're flying one of these early on. Now, the signature radius here. Remember, the bigger the signature radius, the easier you are to hit. That signature radius is right up there with cruisers. This is a large target, and with a flight velocity of only 244 meters per second, it's not particularly fast moving either, which is one of the weaknesses of destroyers. You've got the same kind of target size as a cruiser, but you just don't have the tanking capability and the defense of a cruiser, so you are a lot more fragile. But you are a little bit more nimble as well, and you can pack the same amount of firepower. You'll see that when we fit this catalyst later, it actually has almost a cruiser's amount of firepower on it, straight up and down, despite it being considerably cheaper than a cruiser, both in terms of the actual cost of the hull and the cost of the fittings, and in the cost, both ISK and skill points, of training into the required skills. Now finally at the bottom here, if we have a look, we have a fairly high mass for a destroyer, 1.55 kilograms, and an inertia modifier of 2.1 times. Now all you need to know here is that the higher your mass and the higher your inertia modifier, the, the more cumbersome your ship is, the longer it takes to accelerate and decelerate, and the more, the more difficult a time you're going to have maintaining a sharp orbit. Now of course you can have a high mass, but with a lower inertia modifier you become more agile, and if you can reduce your mass then you will uh, compared to your inertia modifier again that increases agility if you can do both of them that's awesome there's nothing in the game that i'm aware of that drops a ship's mass mass is something that only increases like when you activate an afterburner on micro warp drive inertia modifier however can be reduced with certain rigs etc but obviously the catalyst here does not have rigs so that's not something we need to worry about just yet What's worth noting there, though, is that with this particular catalyst, if you compare this to the other Tech 3 destroyers, this is actually one of the more nimble and agile. It's more nimble than the Cormorant. It's very close to the Coercer. It's not quite the same as the Thrasher, though. The Thrasher is by far the most uh, agile of all of these. Then if we have a look here in the trait descriptions, being a gunboat destroyer, it has a roll bonus of a 25% increase to the optimal range of its small weapon system of choice, in this case railguns, so we're getting additional optimal range to either snub-nosed or rifled railguns, and then if we look at small railgun operation, every skill level that we train into that is going to give us 6% small railgun damage, that's 30% of full training at level 5, and a 5% increase to small railgun accuracy falloff. So what you're going to get there is a 25% increase to small railgun optimal range and a 25% increase to the small accuracy fall off, which kind of insinuates here that we're looking less at things like the rifled railguns. This seems to be built more towards snub nosed. If you want to use rifled railguns, I'm not going to stop you and it will work very effectively, but you do have the capability of getting a good amount of damage out of the snub nosed railguns, and if you're fitting for those, as I said earlier, you will be getting the highest theoretical DPS of any of the gun boat turrets at the equivalent level. Finally, Destroyer Command here will give you a 5% increase to the size of your armor tank per level. So again, at Destroyer Command 5, that's going to be an additional 25% armor. So you're getting 844 plus 25% at full training. Anyway, with all that said and done then, let's jump into looking at fitting this thing and how I would recommend fitting it. By the time you can fly the Tech 3 Catalyst, of course you can also fit Mark 3 equipment. So, I've fitted out the Catalyst here with entirely Mark 3 equipment. 
I've gone for three Mark III small snub-nosed railguns. As you can see here, these have an optimal range of 2.61 kilometers with an accuracy falloff of 3.66. If you're looking at your catalyst and wondering why you don't have the same DPS or the same range, it will be because of the skills that I've trained. I currently have small railgun operation at five, small advanced small railgun operation at five, and expert small railgun operation at three. I then have small railgun upgrade at five, and advanced small railgun upgrade at four. So that's where the discrepancies here will come into play. But you're getting about two and a half kilometers of optimal range, and about three and a half kilometers of accuracy fall off. Now that means that you're going to be 100% effective anywhere up to about two and a half kilometers. And as you go beyond that and start approaching the six kilometer mark, which is optimal range plus one accuracy fall off, you will gradually be dropping down to about 50% effectiveness. As you go an additional accuracy fall off beyond that, so you're now looking at about nine and a half kilometers, that's when you're hitting basically 0% effectiveness. So ideally, you want to be as close to your optimal range as possible when using snub-nosed railguns, as every kilometer beyond that really hurts the effectiveness of your guns. But the DPS that they can kick out is absolutely monstrous, 45.6 DPS here. That is thanks to 66.93 thermal damage and 110 kinetic damage. This means that railguns are aimed slightly more at dealing with armor tanks. They punch through armor better than they punch through shields. They're still good at going through shields thanks to a decent amount of thermal there. But the fact that it's mainly kinetic means that that damage does apply better to the armor of a target. It, they also activate nice and quickly here. You can see just under four seconds activation time. That's basically the time between shots. So you're getting good damage, fast rate of fire, gives you very high DPS. Now, in order to increase that DPS a little bit more, we actually have fitted here a magnetic field stabilizer. This is what's called a weapon upgrade module. And the idea of this is that when you have this fitted to your ship, it gives a damage bonus of 5% to any railgun. That's small, medium, or large railguns. And that, that gives a 5% bonus to the damage of those railguns. And at the bottom here, you can see it reduces the activation time by 3.25%. That's just for having the magnetic field stabilizer fitted. You can then activate this, and it will activate for, in my case, 23 seconds. It'll be slightly lower if you haven't trained as high into railgun skills, um, but you can activate it for around 20-23 seconds, and it will give an additional 6.49 damage, and it will boost the activation time adjustment by 400%. So that increases the 3.25 by 400%, taking it up to basically 16% re uh, reduced activation time. So you're getting much faster firing and higher damage. It does then have a cooldown of 60 seconds, so you can only use it for a period, and then you have to wait 60 seconds before you can activate that magnetic sta field stabilizer again. But it means you can get some really good damage if you need to, and you can just kind of punch something in the face nice and quickly. Now you'll notice that I've gone for a small shield booster here. I've done an entire video on why shield tanking is currently better in EVE Echoes compared to armor tanking, but for here just suffice it to say that even if you train into armor skills, if you've got armor skills and shield skills at equal level, you'll find that shield boosters will heal more shield per activation, um, per duration, and per gigajoule of capacitor. They are more efficient, they are just better overall, and will heal you faster and keep you healthier. The only time you ever want to use an armor repairer rather than a small shield booster is if your ship gets explicit bonuses to armor repairers. The Catalyst does not have bonuses to armor repairers, therefore we use a small shield booster, and that's how we're going to stay alive. This does use up a fair amount of capacitor, which is why I've got a small energy Nosferatu here fitted into the mid slots. Again, I've done an entire video here on how uh, small energy, no well, how energy Nosferatus work and what they do. Basically, the short version of this is that they activate, um, in this case, every four seconds, and it takes 32 gigajoules out of the target ship and puts it into yours. It's a way of leeching capacitor off the enemy ship and keeping your batteries fully charged, though they are very short range at 4.5. 72 kilometers for optimal range that of course is within the optimal range here of the well it's longer than the optimal range of the snub-nosed railgun so if we're sitting at optimal for the snub-nosed railgun it means that the energy nosferatu is also going to be within optimal range and doing the best drain it can 
Now, obviously, with something like the Catalyst, we need to be able to move around fairly quickly. If you want to be a... if you're moving quickly, you're going to be a harder target to hit. So we have a small afterburner here. This will increase our flight velocity adjustment by 156%. Means we're going to be going a lot faster. Now, yes, you may have looked at a micro warp drive and said, well, hang on, doesn't that make me go even faster? Yes, but micro warp drives also increase your signature radius, which makes you a much bigger target. And the increase to the signature radius usually outweighs the flight speed increase. And also, a micro warp drive cuts off the top 25% of your capacitor just for having it fitted. So if you had a capacitor of 100 gigajoule, well, say a 400 gigajoule capacitor, if you fit a micro warp drive, your capacitor is now only 300 gigajoules. The afterburner is all we need here, it is the better option here for speed tanking, it means we can move nice and quickly, we become a harder target to hit, and we can maintain range with those snub-nosed railguns. Of course, if you are sort of 15 kilometers away from a ship, your snub-nosed are going to be doing nothing, so you want to close that gap as quickly as possible, and the afterburner is going to help us do that. We also have a stasis webifier though, Mark III stasis webifier here, which is designed mainly to help hold an opponent in position. Again, we want to be able to be close to an enemy with a, to fire those snub-nosed railguns. Now, if our enemy is a fairly fast-moving ship, we need to slow it down so that it doesn't outpace us. That's where the web of fire here comes into effect. Obviously, it's got a very short range of 10.6 kilometers, but again, that's still longer than the guns. Um, so we get within 10.6 kilometers, we activate the web of fire, that will slow the target down, we then move in and orbit them at two or three kilometers with those uh, rail guns going and dealing as much damage as possible. Now with the skills that I've got, 136.79 DPS out of a Tech 3 Destroyer is monstrous. That's a really high amount of DPS. Defense as well, 3480 is pretty solid. Again, most of this here is in the armor thanks to the bonuses that the Catalyst gets. It does now even exceed its structure hit points. The capacitor is not only stable, it is very stable. It's stable there at about 75%. That's a huge, uh, sorry, at 59%. That's a huge amount of capacitor stability there. It means we're not going to be draining anytime soon. We can have everything here running and our capacitor will not run out. Under our targeting system here, you'll see a scan resolution of 607 millimeters, means we can lock on fairly quickly. We do have that large signature radius of 65 meters, which means we are fairly easy to hit. And under our navigation panel, First of all, we have a maximum velocity of 329.4 meters per second. Of course, the uh, the afterburner will increase that as well, and a warp preparation time of 3.54 seconds. That means from an absolute standstill, it will take three and a half seconds for when you tap warp to your ship aligning and achieving the velocity required to actually achieve warp. So it's not the ideal. You can get caught in gate camps with this. Um, if someone does come in, they do have enough time to lock onto you and get that before you can warp out. So you just need to be a little bit careful around PvP environments and anything there because your warp preparation is a little bit higher than we might like. I think it's all very well and good me talking about the Catalyst here. Let's actually take this out into combat and showcase how it works. Now, when I'm doing this showcase, you'll see that I've actually swapped all of the gear on the Catalyst out for meta level 5 gear. Now, what I mean there is here we've got Mark III small snub-nosed railguns, and here you can see it says meta level 1. There are items of gear in the game that have special names like Quaif snub-nosed railguns or um, things like Ranger, small afterburners, veteran small shield boosters, that kind of thing. Those are higher meta level. They cost a bit more, um, but the ones with those little green icons and special names can, by, can be used by anyone of any particular level. I'm using the meta level 5 versions in the combat demonstration to show how far up you can go with the Tech 3 Catalyst. Basically, fly a Tech 3 Catalyst, and as you go up the skill levels and start earning ISK, start upgrading your gear. Once you have enough gear, like um, all up to meta level 5, you'll be able to do encounters like you're about to witness. So here we have a Tech 7 combat encounter. This is one of the Glente ones. I can't remember exactly which name it was off the top of my head right now, but we're about to come into Wave 3. As I said, I've got the exact same gear as I've just shown in the video in the fitting section, but I've upgraded it all to meta level 5. Now, I found it quite interesting back then that the Myrmidon is normally considered to be sort of a vertical catalyst, but because of how I'm orbiting here, you can see that the, the Myrmidon's gone horizontal like the catalyst, and the catalyst has gone vertical like the Myrmidon. They kind of swapped. 
Anyway, we're coming into wave three of this Tech 7 combat encounter now, so I'm going to lock onto everything, and I'm going to start with the smaller targets first, because the smaller targets are the ones that are going to be able to hit me and deal more damage. So that's going to be the Corelli Algos Assault here. I'm locking onto that. I've hit orbit, and my orbit is set as a default currently of zero kilometers, just to see how close we can get and how that tight that orbit will be. I've got the Afterburner running to keep me going uh, nice and fast. I've got the Nosferatu going to keep draining the enemy ships and filling up my capacitor. I've got the shield booster going so that you can see here we're taking a bit of damage but it repairs up nice and quickly and the stasis webifier there is going as well just to hold that algos assault in place and stop it from running away just make sure that I can maintain I'm sitting within the optimal range of my right uh, of those snub nose railguns and you can see here it's doing quite a lot of damage to this tech 7 ship and ripping through it nice and quickly You'll see as well, um, I did have the uh, the magnetic field stabilizer going there, which meant I was doing slightly more damage with that active. Now that that's deactivated, it's on cooldown, I'm not doing quite as much damage per shot, and there's a bit more time between shots, but yeah, it's not, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Now, with that particular ship down, with the Algos down, I've had a look at my overview here, and if you have a look at the four ships currently remaining, you'll see that one of them does not have a flashing box around it. That means The flashing box means that that ship is locked onto me and is targeting me. It's yellow if it's just locked on, and it's red if it's targeting you. Here you can see it doesn't have either. That ship is ignoring me. That means it is a logistics vessel, kind of the healer of the group. It's not locked onto me because it's equipped with healing gear, which it's going to be healing up the the rest of the fleet with. As such, I tend to take these as fairly high priority targets too. And you'll see that I'm now orbiting this at one kilometer. I'm activating the weapon upgrade module there, the magnetic field stabilizer, and we're going to just going to rip through this as quickly as possible. Now we are getting low on capacitor, that's mainly because this Celestis Cover Ops has a Nosferatu on us. So whereas I'm draining capacitor out of their ship, they're doing the same right back to me, and that is going to be affecting, obviously, our capacitor stability. That's why I want to get rid of this one quickly. The sensor dampener that it's doing is almost worthless, does absolutely nothing to us, but that Nosferatu is causing a slight problem with the stability of our capacitor, so we're going to take this ship out as quickly as possible. Um, obviously, after we've got the logistics one down. The logistics one's going to go down first, and we're coming to the bottom of its structure pool now. I'll then move on to the Corellum Celestis that's currently at seven kilometers, and the one that is hitting us with an Osferatu. There we are. I'm going to hit orbit on it, because it's going to take a while to adjust to that. We're going to blow up that first one and move in here. And you can see quite comfortably now, I'm taking very little damage at all, because these are now cruiser and battle cruiser sized ships. They're using medium turrets, and medium turrets don't have as good tracking as small turrets, which means they struggle to hit smaller, faster moving targets. Now for all my bluster in saying that it's quite a big target, it is big compared to frigates and some of the other destroyers you'll see later. But the Catalyst, ultimately, it's still a fairly small target, and with that Afterburner running, it's a fast-moving small target. I'm hitting, in certain cases, up to 600 meters per second. I'm sitting comfortably around the 500 meters per second mark, which makes me fairly difficult to hit. And it means I'm taking very little damage, and the Shield Booster is more than sufficient there at keeping all of that going. And once this, Core uh, this Corellum Celestis is down, and I've got that Nosferatu out of the way, I am very much out of the woods. No real problems happening here at all. So we're going to move on now from this, because I think it's clear that this Tech 7 encounter is going to be beaten here by a Tech 3 Catalyst, which I love it. I just love the fact that you can take a Tech 3 Catalyst out all the way up to Tech Level 7 and still clear that content. This is a ship that is an excellent starting vessel, um, and you can take it all the way up to Tech Level 7 and it will still operate. Um, as a just quick point before we move on, this mission is one of the ones I think it's about 80 million, uh, 80 million, sorry, um, 80,000 isk. Um, you get the reward for doing this particular one, um, so that, and it took about 35 minutes to complete. Now, 35 minutes to complete, that's a good amount of money, and you can see I'm earning about 90, uh, 95,000 per ship destroyed as well, means this is an excellent way of making money. Now, whilst I've showcased that the Tech 3 Catalyst can take you all the way up to Tech 7 content with the right skills and fit, it's probably worth noting that you're unlikely to do that. If you're flying a Catalyst and enjoying it, chances are you're going to want to upgrade as time goes on. 
When you hit tech level 4, you get the option to upgrade into the Catalyst 2. And in honesty, you can upgrade into this one if you're an alpha player and you want to just upgrade quickly. The Catalyst 2 is not a bad ship to upgrade into straight away. You're getting an additional high slot. So even though the amount of damage that the railguns do has dropped in regards to the skills, you're getting an additional high slot, which means you're now carrying four of those railguns. That's already a 33% increase in the DPS. The fact that the skill percentage has gone down a little bit means you are still doing more damage than before, but you're not just suddenly exploding with extra damage. You also have these two rigs here, the two uh, sort of ex uh, two brackets and the two square brackets you can see on the right there. These are special things that you can fit to your ship that unfortunately cannot be unplugged without destroying them. So whereas you can fit a turret and take it out again without worrying, once a rig has been fitted, if you try and take it out, you will destroy it. So you do need to think carefully about what rigs you're going to use. Now the Catalyst 2 makes a great little stepping stone. If you are going to hit Tech 5 at a fairly quick rate, it might just be worth holding on for the Catalyst Navy issue. Now this is quite an interesting looking ship as well. I love the fact that it's got sort of the camo uh, design here. Although again, this is a spaceship. It's 286 meters long. Painting it in camo doesn't suddenly hide it. You know, that's it. <laughs> it's a spaceship. You don't hide it with camo. Again, like with the basic Tech 3 Catalyst, you do get the Halorange skin from, uh, from, from the Crimson Harvest Halloween event. These are sometimes available on the market if you keep an eye out for them. This one I do like. I didn't like the Tech 3 version because it's got that vibrant yellow on it, but here it's just the slate grey and black and that vibrant orange, and that I actually really quite like. Very handsome. Anyway, so what has changed between the Catalyst Tech 3 and the Catalyst Navy issue? Well, again, we've got that additional high slot, so we've got four gun turrets that we're going to be able to fit onto this. We've got a third mid slot, which means we can add a bit more of sort of our tackle and e war. There, we've got a bit more variety going on. We have two combat rigs and two power grid rigs, which I'll talk about more later. We've got a bigger power grid, so we can fit more stuff to it, and that stuff can be higher level gear without chewing up all your power grid and requiring massive amounts of destroyer engineering. The defense has gone right the way up, 4,742. You can see the structure is already sitting at nearly 1,400. The armor's not far behind it, and the shield is still over 1,100. That's not bad at all defensively. The signature radius has dropped quite dramatically as well, down to 59.2 meters, which makes us a harder target to hit, and we are faster moving now at 265 meters per second. The mass and the inertia are the same, so we've still got the same agility. The capacitors are bigger, so we don't have to worry as much about our capacitor running out, although in fairness, as you saw earlier, it was stable anyway. And we've got a better scan resolution, so we can lock onto enemies faster. If we're looking at the trait description, the Catalyst Navy issue suddenly has a small railgun optimal range increase of 25%. I say suddenly, I don't know why I use that word, because it's exactly the same as the Tech 3 Catalyst. Every Catalyst in the game, whether it's the Catalyst, Catalyst 2, Catalyst Navy issue, Catalyst Interdictor, Catalyst Guardian, Catalyst 2 Interdictor, or Catalyst Covert Ops, has that same roll bonus. Why did the word suddenly come into my vocabulary there? I don't know. Anyway, small railgun operation, we're now getting 5% small railgun damage, so a 25% increase on the damage that, that you would have fitted cold, and a 7.5% increase to small railgun tracking speed, that's 37.5% increase at full level 5 there of small railgun operation. Now that of course means that you are going to be tracking faster, it means your turrets hold, their, hold the target in their sights much easier. And you've still got a small railgun accuracy falloff increase here of 7.5% as well, that's bigger than on the Catalyst. So rather than a 25% increase to the optimal uh, the accuracy fall off, you're getting a 37.5% increase there. We're still getting the 5% increase to the armor, though of course that armor tank is now bigger, so we're getting a an additional 25% on 1,367. We're getting more scan resolution so we can lock on faster, and we're getting more sensor strength, which does nothing. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, as well, what's worth noting here is it's small railgun operation and destroyer command. There are no advanced skills required here, which means every skill that you need for the Catalyst Navy issue to get the most out of it is trainable as an alpha pilot. 
And if we go straight into the fitting section now, you'll see that everything I'm using here, again, is meta level 8 stuff. So this is all, or I say all of it, not all of it is. The interruptive here is only meta level 5, um, as are the Nosferatu. Now, in fact, everything's meta level 5, except for the turrets. The snub-nosed railguns are meta level 8, because these are super cheap on the market. Everything else is meta level 5. You can see it says under the name here, like the Settler, Smuggler, Small Afterburner. It's the exact same fit as we saw before. The only difference is we've now got an additional high slot, so we've got four small snub-nosed railguns rather than three, and in the mid slots we've got an interruptive warp scrambler added too. Now, Warp Scramblers do two things. First of all, they apply Warp Jammer Strength to the target. In this case, the Interruptive Warp Scrambler applies four Warp Jammer Strength. Now, if you can apply enough Warp Jammer Strength to a target to hold it in position, it means it cannot warp away. This is very useful for player versus player combat because it stops your opponent running away before you have chance to kill them. Very useful to have. The other side of things is that a Warp Scrambler also switches off the target's Micro Warp Drive. Now, if you're going into slightly higher tier content, you do start to see ships that are moving at a ridiculously fast speed. Even hitting them with a stasis weapon fire sometimes isn't enough, and you can struggle to catch up with them. So, you hit them with a warp scrambler, and it'll switch off their micro warp drive and bring them back down to basic propulsion speed. Then, your stasis weapon fire does its thing and reduces their basic, pr their basic propulsion speed by a further 57%. You now have gone from a very fast and hard to hit target to something that is very, very small and easy to hit. That's mainly why we have the Warp Scrambler fitted to here, and that is actually one of the more expensive modules on this, but they are very useful and they're dropping in price constantly. What's worth noting here is that now we have rigs at the bottom, and if I tap on this little sort of spanner here, it takes us through to the rig panel. Now, rigs, as I said, are these special modules that can be used to do all kinds of extra stuff on the ship. And if we have a look at under events, for example, where are you hiding here? Um, you'll see that as part of the daily login reward, you sometimes get rig safes. Now, if I look, here's one here, a weapon rig safe. This gives these different weapon rig safes that you can use, and they will give you prototype rigs. That means those are completely free. The Tech 1 rigs are very cheap on the market, um, most of them are at least, and the Tech 2 rigs and Tech 3 rigs can cost an awful lot more. Use the free ones if you can, keep this ship nice and cheap, it doesn't need to be super expensive. Now the ones I've gone for here are two railgun burst aerators. These mean that the railguns activate 7.5% faster each. And it does say at the bottom here that there's a penalty for using more than one of this type of module, um, which means it's not 7.5 plus 7.5, meaning 15% reduction. That second one does get a penalty, which takes it down to about 6% effectiveness. But that's still pretty good, right? That's still a good increase to the damage. And you'll see that our DPS here is sitting at a monstrous 320.52. Now, the rigs here on the uh, on the engineering side, these are the expensive ones. For some reason, auxiliary thrusters and polycarbon engine housings, even tier 1, are ridiculously expensive on the market. So stick with prototypes if you've got them. They're all you need. The auxiliary thrusters here make you move faster. Obviously, the faster you're moving, the tougher a target you are to hit. And polycarbon engine housing reduces the inertia modifier of the ship as well, which makes you that little bit more agile, able to hold a tighter orbit. You accelerate and decelerate faster, that kind of thing. Stick with the prototypes here, unless you've got money to burn and you're certain that this particular ship is the one that you want to burn it on. Now, with the same skills that I mentioned earlier, I've now gone from that catalyst we saw up to here 320.52 DPS, and that's before we activate the uh, magnetic field stabilizer. Defense is all the way at 5,439, our flight speed is 384.25 before we activate the propulsion module, and our warp preparation time has dropped to 3.18 rather than 3.4. Our capacitor is still very stable, obviously we've got a few more modules on here now so it's not quite as stable as it was before, but it's still stable. With everything running, we don't run out of capacitor, it stops at about 55.1%. And if we look at targeting, we have a very high scan resolution of 789, so we lock on quickly with a signature radius of 59 meters. Now what I want to do here is showcase this in action in a Tech 8 encounter, just to showcase that if you're using a Catalyst Navy issue, you can actually take this all the way up to Tech Level 8 content and be making good ISK per hour there as well, because these are like 950 million ISK per encounter, and I'm finishing those encounters in less than half an hour. So that's nine, call that a million ISK. 
That's 2 million isk per hour for the encounter, plus any bounties that you get for killing the ships, plus any loot they drop. That is a very good way of making money as an alpha pilot without using an expensive ship. This is Security Threat Hard, a Galente Tech 8 encounter. You'll see this is now wave 2 going down and we're going into wave 3 tech level 8 encounter here using that same catalyst navy issue that we've just talked about. You can see there's a lot of ships spawn in this wave. I'm going to go again for the smallest ones first of all. So we're going to be looking at like the Atron Interceptors there and the Algos C. And if you're interested to know what an Algos C is, again, I did do a video on those C destroyers as well because they're not actually available to fly yet on the live servers. Anyway, it looks like I'm taking a whole load of damage to my shields. And yeah, you'd be right. I am taking a whole load of damage, but we're going to stay calm and we're going to keep at this. We're going to get rid of that first Atron now. That's going to go down in the next shot. Just now that's a little bit less damage we're going to be taking. And I'm looking at that Rioter Algos C here on the right hand side. This is currently scrambling or disrupting me. It's going to stop me warping out, which means if things go wrong, I have no way of escaping. That means this guy is going to be a fairly primary target now for me, just in case I start taking entirely too much damage and I need to flee this encounter quickly. So he's going to be the next one to go down. You can see a couple of volleys there. It's going to take him down. And I've taken a tiny bit of damage into my armor tank there. I'm at 96% armor. The shield booster isn't quite keeping up with the amount of damage but we're not in any real danger yet and with that scrambler gone I can now run away if I do start to come into heavy heavy danger just loot quickly as I fly away and I'm going to get rid of each of these small targets one by one now the reason I go for the small targets first one Small ships like destroyers and frigates have small weapons, and small weapons apply their damage better against small targets. They're harder to speed tank. I don't avoid the damage from those as well. Secondly, they're quick to kill. If I've got 10 ships and I can kill, I've got a choice of I can kill one cruiser or I can kill three frigates, I'm going to get rid of the three frigates first because that's three ships down, it's three fewer ships shooting at me. And you can see now, all of the destroyers, all of the frigates are now gone, and I'm left with two cruisers and two battle cruisers, and I'm taking almost no damage again now, so my shield booster has now repaired me all the way back up. I've got taken a tiny amount of damage into the armor there, I think I'm sitting at just under 90% armor, but my shield is almost back at 100%. So, oh no, I have to pay a tiny amount of repair cost next time I dock to replenish that. As you'll see, the amount of like isk that I earn from killing these particular ships just outweighs that dramatically. I'm going for the Thorax 2 Guardian now as well, because as we mentioned earlier, it doesn't have that flashing square, which means it is the logistics ship. I'd rather get rid of that one so I don't have to fight against uh, the healing effects that it's applying to other ships. You can actually see that sort of blue line, bluish green line coming out of it and shooting into the distance. That is it healing up a distant ship. So we're going to take this one out first and have a look at how much you earn in the bounty just for killing that Rioter Thorax 2. Remember, this is a 950,000 isk mission, so it's almost a million isk on its own for completing the mission. Um, plus, here we go, it's going to go down now, next shot. 200,000 just for that Thorax. That's now already over a million that I'm earning, just on that one ship and the mission itself. This took the entire encounter here, takes less than half an hour in this ship. It took about 24 minutes. 24 minutes to earn um, nearly a million isk in the encounter itself, plus all the bounties from the various ships, plus all the loot that I pick up and uh, reprocess and sell at the end. That is big money there. That, that, as an alpha clone, this is a very easy way to make a lot of money. And I know a lot of people focus on these big, scary storyline missions, and you need to be doing like the Tech 10 ones. Why? Why do you want to focus on a Tech 10 mission? As, a, as an alpha player, you can jump in a catalyst here, very high DPS, clear out a Tech level 8 encounter in under half an hour. So two of these, in, you know, in less than an hour, you can do two of these. That's 2 million isk in the encounter rewards, plus all of the bounties that you get, plus all of the loot. That is a serious amount of isk. 
Anyway, just to showcase this, and obviously show that I am like recording this as footage after, I am going to scrub ahead here toward the end of this encounter, so you can see that I do actually clear the entire thing, but I just don't want to sit here and show you everything blow by blow, because it's a long video, but hey, you can see there, 23 minutes is how long it took to record, and I will showcase at the beginning just to, to prove that you see me warping in at the very start of it. There we are, there's the rewards there at the end coming through, gonna loot everything else, 85,000 disc for killing that Vexa, and there we go, sorry, it was 850,000, no, no, it wasn't 95,000, uh, 950,000 uh, 950, one, it's just, uh, that's just taxes coming through, but yep, yeah, just to scrub all the way back to the start of this, you'll see here we are, jumping into it now, security threat there, jumping in, 23 minutes of uninterrupted mission there, to earn myself way into the millions of isk. Nice easy way of doing it in a ship that doesn't cost much to build or fit. The whole ship, not including the rigs, um, not including the rigs, this whole ship is literally about 10 million isk, not even, um, at which point the skills aren't much either. Do a couple of these missions and you've made that isk back itself and off you go from there. Anyway, folks, thank you for watching this one right the way to the end. I hope you've enjoyed. If you do like the Catalyst line of ships, I, I I find them unusual to look at, but they're still good fun to fly. I love destroyers. I know so many people say, oh, destroyers are underwhelming. They're not worth it. Here's proof that they are. This is a cheap ship capable of making its own money back in literally like two hours and two hours of combat, at which point it becomes a very quick and easy encounter runner. It moves between the encounters nice and quickly as well, so it's... It's a great way of making money without having to spend much yourself to get it off the ground. Anyway, folks, let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below. Stay tuned for a moment because I'm going to be announcing the winners of last week's giveaway. Otherwise, happy sailing and see you in New Eden. If you've stuck around to this part of the video, it means you're keen to find out who won last week's Combo Omega giveaway. I asked you to tell me which of the uh, E-War cruisers looked most exciting to you or that you were scared of the most, just to talk about them and get some cool ideas. Now our two winners are going to be Cold Shadow and The Unit, and I just have to say, even though this was randomly selected, Cold Shadow's post just had me in hysterics, and now every time I see a bellicose, I get row, row, row your boat stuck in my head. So congratulations to you two if you can reach out to me either here in the comment section down below or by coming and finding me on Discord. Again, link is in the description of this video. Come and find me on Discord. Let me know uh, your character details that you want to receive your month of Combo Omega. Congratulations, folks. And for the rest of you, do stay tuned. Later this week, there will be another Combo Omega giveaway for two more lucky winners to receive a month of Combo Omega each. Anyway, folks, happy sailing, and see you in New Eden.